We're delighted to be with you, our friends and alumni and alumnae uh, from Fairfield University in Prep. This morning, I'd like to introduce you to someone who many of you have uh, seen from afar, and you've certainly, if you've been tuning in regularly to our streaming liturgies, or if you had been during the academic year uh, assisting at the liturgies in Egan Chapel, uh, you would have gotten to know Father Paul Rohr. But this is an opportunity uh, for me to uh, speak with him and uh, invite him to share more of the details of his story. That Paul is our campus minister uh, is really uh, kind of uh, not necessarily intuitive. Uh, Paul is, uh, after all, uh, not a native of New England. He's not a Charlie Allen uh, <laughs> or a Father Jim Bowler or a Father Michael Duty. Uh, Paul comes from St. Louis. He's a St. Louis native. And he was not educated by the Jesuits in secondary school, as many of us were who, who, who entered the Society of Jesus. Paul was educated by the Benedictines. So, Paul, what in the world are you doing as a Jesuit? How did someone who went to a Benedictine prep school and then went on to uh, law school and began practicing law, how in the world did you find yourself uh, as a Jesuit? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think uh, vocation, um, my vocation, like so many vocations, um, starts uh, starts at home. I think I had a, a, um, a pretty good foundation there. My, both my parents uh, were committed to their practices of faith. Uh, and it was very much growing up a, a, a faith life that was centered around our parish. Uh, uh, my father, um, who died when I was young, but when he was, uh, when he was alive, was very involved in coaching and uh, different things for the parish schools. This parish, the parish teams. Um, my mother uh, was uh, president of the parish council, uh, and was they were just both very involved. It was not a. I wouldn't say we had a very kind of overly pious uh, home environment in the sense we didn't pray the rosary together or uh, do a lot of devotional practices. But mass was very much at the heart of uh, of our experience, and so many of our friends family friends came out of the, uh, the Paris that we were uh, active in. So I think that was the foundation that I had. And then I had really wonderful uh, teachers in the faith. Uh, so I'm just very blessed uh, all along the way to have had really uh, wonderful, inspiring uh, priests and others who have uh, taught me. Uh, and so, um, Father uh, Blaschek mentioned the Benedictines. I went to a high school in St. Louis, St. Louis Priory High School, uh, which was founded originally by monks from England uh, who came over. And for my seventh grade uh, religion class, uh, I had a, an extraordinary uh, man as my uh, teacher who has been a friend and a mentor uh, throughout my life, uh, Father, uh, his then brother, uh, Thomas Perking. And uh, he was uh, somebody who um, was born into a Lutheran family. Uh, he was uh, paralyzed at the age of two with polio. Uh, and he went on to uh, be first in his class at Harvard, uh, was a Rhodes Scholar, uh, had a, uh, did a doctorate uh, at Oxford with Elizabeth Anscombe, uh, was a, one of the great leaders in great Catholic philosophers, but a real sort of leader in analytic philosophy. And uh, here was this guy who had all these credentials uh, and he had come to the faith, kind of an intellectual journey. Uh, and uh, through the experience of getting to know other Catholics at Oxford. Uh, and he was just this holy man who was able to, uh, for a young um, teenager, make the faith reasonable. Uh, you know, so he was never afraid of questions and he gave very intelligent answers to those questions or, or confessed if he didn't know the answer uh, and he was, you know, willing to, uh, to be honest about that. Uh, but he just had this kind of radiant joy about him. 
And so Father Thomas, I think, was just an instrumental uh, influence for me uh, of somebody who modeled Christian joy and the intelligibility of, of Christian faith uh, and that you could be uh, somebody who was questioning and intelligent uh, who believed. Uh, and I think that uh, that's really critical at that stage of life because that's the time when you start to question, uh, when you start to hear a lot of criticisms of, of your faith and its teachings. And if you don't have somebody who's a good guide, you can very easily sort of dismiss uh, or become cynical about uh, your faith. And, and he was always a, a wonderful uh, example. We also had many uh, in my parish, we had some wonderful priests, uh, uh, Monsignor O'Donnell who became a bishop and was just a real uh, support to my family when my father died. Um, so that was kind of the early foundation uh, of my vocation. And I think when I was in grammar school, say probably around fifth grade, I started to think about being a priest. Uh, so I had early on some inkling of a desire. And then when I got to high school, I kind of put that out of my mind. It wasn't the cool thing to do. Uh, and I didn't want to be uh, sort of uh, boxed in by that. Uh, and all the things that go with, you know, your discovery of yourself in high school uh, were true for me. And, and I think, um, I kind of put that all out of my mind. Uh, then I went to uh, college. I was uh, first at Holy Cross and then at Georgetown. Um, I transferred after my freshman year. And uh, when I was at Georgetown, I again had these great teachers uh, in the faith, uh, some Jesuits who, um, some of whom have gone to the Lord, but uh, were uh, really remarkable uh, men who influenced me. There was a, particularly a Jesuit, Father Tom King, uh, who uh, would have a mass every, uh, every day and on Sunday uh, at 11.15 at night. It was the last possible chance you could go to mass. And I think it was with Father King that I first discovered a love for the liturgy. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you'd think I would have gotten it from the Benedictines, but because uh, that's really more their charism than the Jesuit charism. But uh, I just... He, he had this very kind of mystical quality to the way he would preside at Mass. Uh, and there was a, a sense of intimacy and of uh, mystery and holiness uh, about him and about the way he would celebrate Mass that was really uh, a powerful draw. So I think I first, and it also had something to do with just my age, I guess. It was the first time I really enjoyed going to Mass and that I really felt that I got something out of it. And his preaching seemed to speak directly to my experience, and I think that was the experience of a lot of people who would hear him, uh, that he was just uh, able to touch something deep uh, and awaken it uh, in you. Uh, and so um, I was very, um, you know, that was a, a very important stage in my journey. I remember another conversation I had that was important from somebody who was uh, dear to this place, Father Jeff Bonarx. He was the chair of the history department at Georgetown when I was there. Uh, and uh, I remember having a conversation, I think it was during confession, uh, and he kind of gently uh, said, you know, uh, we have a way of progressing and growing up in all sorts of other different areas of our life, but not necessarily in our faith life, uh, which was his kind of gentle nudge to me uh, to kind of uh, take it seriously uh, and really uh, try to uh, go a little bit deeper than I had been going. So I, I went on uh, a number of uh, retreats uh, at Georgetown, uh, and there were two that were really very important for me. One was um, a retreat called Agape, um, and that was this very deep experience uh, of God's love uh, for me, uh, feeling loved in a really powerful way. And that faith was not just about uh, obligations or about uh, community, you know, in the sense of being with other people, uh, but it was profoundly an experience of God's touching your heart, loving you. Uh, and 
I had never felt it so powerfully uh, and immediately as I did in that retreat up until that point in my life. So that awakened me to just this whole other world of what, uh, what our faith could be. Um, and then another retreat that was very important for me in, the, in my own discernment uh, and uh, my own journey is I had done, a, I graduated uh, Georgetown um, and I had uh, decided uh, to go to law school. Uh, and I did that because, uh, partly because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And in that time, uh, this would have been 1994, uh, economy wasn't terrific. Uh, and a lot of people were going to law school uh, just to kind of uh, have another uh, thing on their resume. So there was a little bit of that. There was uh, a desire to get involved in, in the political sphere, uh, which is part of the reason I went to Georgetown. So I had an interest in politics or some kind of government service. Uh, and I thought this was a good way to do that. But I, even at the, uh, towards the end of my time at Georgetown, I started to have this reawakening of not just mature faith, but of a desire for priesthood maybe, uh, or religious life. And I started to think about it uh, in that, sort of towards my senior, in my senior year at Georgetown. And so, um, this was something I brought with me to law school. And then after my first year of law school, I uh, went uh, on a five day silent retreat uh, through Georgetown. Uh, and uh, I, had, I was going to law school at Washington University in St. Louis, but I had come back to work uh, during the summer in, in Washington. And uh, I decided uh, at the end of my summer to do this five day silent retreat. And, uh, and I really wanted to figure out if I called to be a Jesuit or not. And I thought, well, I'll just go to this retreat and I'll surely be able to know the answer to that. And um, I went in with this desire to know and yet this fear, a tremendous fear uh, that somehow God was going to swoop in and that if I opened the door, God was going to take over uh, and that would be the end of the story. And suddenly I'd be carried away uh, I'd be a Jesuit or a priest, and, uh, and all these uh, things would follow, and I would so suddenly uh, lose my freedom in some way. And so I was really terrified uh, in that retreat that that would happen. Uh, and the real grace, uh, which certainly was helped by my spiritual director uh, during the retreat of Father O'Connell, um, was the discovery that that's not the way God operates, that God doesn't just kind of swoop in and take over, uh, that uh, what I wanted in the depths of my heart, which I still at that point wasn't sure of, was what God wanted for me. Uh, that there wasn't this disconnect of God imposing uh, his will on me and uh, trying to fit the, the square peg in the round hole or something. Um, and so that was a deeply liberating uh, experience. Uh, and it allowed uh, my slow discernment to, to go ahead. Um, and then um, I'm cutting out certain details, but uh, I progressively had this uh, sense that uh, through, through the end of, towards the end of law school, that this is where I felt called uh, to society. Um, but I was a little bit in between uh, the Jesuits and the Benedictines. Uh, I felt an attraction to both, actually. Um, and, uh, but it was a return. I had a, went back to Georgetown that spring of my third year of law school, and I had a, a really um, aha, graced moment uh, when I went back to the mass that I used to attend. Uh, that Father King presided at, and I, I just said, this is what I want. Uh, and, um, and so to kind of shorten the, the narrative a little bit, I, uh, I was ready to apply, I wanted to apply. The vocation director said, you know, it's a little late in the game. We'd like you to you know, do some uh, uh, further uh, vocation programs with us and 
have us get to know you before we ready to say that you reply. Uh, and so it took a little bit of time. I went and I worked for a little bit longer uh, and I ended up uh, entering when I was uh, 28 years old. Uh, so um, late, a late vocation by the standards of a different time period, sort of an average vocation uh, by today's standards in terms of uh, entering. Uh, but uh, it was a, it was a, a very, um, in some ways it seems very, it's one of those uh, straight with uh, God, what is it, God, God writes straight with crooked lines or something. Uh, you know, I could see a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, interesting turns along the way, but ultimately I think there was a logical progression uh, to, to how it happened. And, and I think my interest in politics, my interest in law uh, is ultimately this deep desire that I have, that I found in the society to um, change or be a force for change in society, uh, to be uh, somebody who is in dialogue with culture, in dialogue with uh, the society we live in today, uh, that uh, is deeply rooted in faith and in the tradition uh, out of which our faith comes. Um, but alive and in contact with uh, the needs of, of real people uh, and able to speak to their desires in a language that uh, is accessible, that's, uh, that's even inspiring. Uh, and so I think that's kind of uh, my own, uh, some of the key parts of my uh, vocation story anyway. Thanks, Paul. Sure. You touched on uh, the connection between uh, what you learned and what motivated you in law school. Uh, and what still shapes your ministry and your understanding of your particular contribution. Um, uh, I wonder whether I would, this would be a good jumping off point to talk about your ministry uh, as the director of campus ministry at the Law Center of Georgetown. Uh, how did your experience of these, uh, the years of discernment and uh, your time working in government and uh, being educated as a lawyer. How, uh, how did you find your experience at the Law Center? Uh, yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, I, I think I loved it. I, I thought it was a really graced period of my life uh, to be at the Law Center. Um, there are a lot of really uh, both serious and intelligent people who are also <coughs> idealistic. Um, so there's a, a level of discussion that you can have with the person who's at that stage of their journey that uh, is, is really rich and interesting. And yet uh, the challenge is that um, with the legal profession, uh, people walk in with a lot of preconceptions about what it has to be. So to give a classic example, um, people think that, you know, the only right way to be a lawyer is to go into big law, what's called big law, so one of the big law firms, uh, and to, you know, make a lot of money right out of law school for good reasons. I mean, a lot of, if you go to law school, you have a, a lot of debt from your, uh, your loans. Uh, and so, you know, that's a significant uh, consideration that you want to have, uh, to be able to, to pay those off. Um, but part of what we did and part of what I think you, you always do in accompanying, uh, accompanying people in whatever uh, setting you're in is trying to give them that deeper sense of freedom uh, uh, to ex you know, show them uh, the broader horizons of how they can use their legal training. Uh, a lot of the work that we did was uh, trying to encourage law students to uh, stay true to their values, to stay true to uh, the reasons, at least the, the, you know, the kind of uh, deeper reasons that they chose the legal profession. Um, it's hard at that stage to kind of, I mean, occasionally I would have students who would come in and it was pretty clear that maybe they had not made the best discernment in going to law school, that it wasn't the best choice for them. Uh, and so, uh, you know, to help them to that, that deeper realization was 
kind of challenging because they'd already made a big investment uh, or to see how maybe they can uh, use what they had in, in, uh, in other ways uh, as for instance I have. Um, so I think uh, what uh, I found helpful was I, I, I could draw from my own experience of law school, a little bit of work experience. I didn't have a lot of work experience, but uh, I could draw from uh, just my own experiences of, especially the first year of law school, which is the one that uh, you know, they say in law school, the first year uh, they scare you to death, the second year they work you to death, and the third year they bore you to death. Uh, <laughs> and so it's really the scaring to death part that most students need help with. So this kind of, uh, Collaborating with a team of people, we worked very closely with our Dean of Students and with uh, the other partners, counseling, uh, our uh, diversity officer, a lot of different uh, great partners that we had that uh, helped uh, just care for the student. And I think that was so different, my own experience. Uh, I think I had a good law school experience, and I think uh, Washington University was a good law school, was a good law school. Um, but there was this definite difference between a Jesuit law school uh, and the care for the whole person that was provided uh, there that, that from what I had experienced in law school. It was just a world of difference in terms of the support system that was there. Well, I wonder whether you could say more about that. I know that the Georgetown law faculty uh, and student body is very diverse. Uh, so. If the majority of your faculty colleagues, administrators uh, are not are not Catholics, have not had a Jesuit education, uh, what's a Jesuit university doing in the law school business? And what was it that a Georgetown approach to education, a Jesuit approach to education, brought to the formation uh, of the faculty, staff, and students in a diverse setting? Yeah. Well, good question. A big question. Um, I think, uh, you know, the motto of the law school is uh, law is but the means, justice is the end. Certainly have that flipped around, but it's, that's the sense, justice is the end and, and law is the means. And so these larger questions about justice, I think, are things that even before uh, the society had its uh, general congregation 32, uh, we've been involved in questions of the common good hot questions of justice. And so uh, I think uh, the society, the Jesuits have always recognized the importance of trying to shape the people who are going to shape society. We're gonna be difference makers in society. Uh, and uh, in our society, as in I think any human society, whether you like it or not, some of the most important influential difference makers are lawyers. Uh, you know, if you look at the leaders of any uh, significant movement, uh, they almost always have a lawyer uh, involved. Uh, you know, in the civil rights movement, you think of Thurgood Marshall. Uh, and uh, so, you know, being able to be part of that discussion uh, and uh, to awaken or to uh, try to encourage uh, deeper questions about justice in society uh, is, I think, I don't want to say that that doesn't happen in other law schools. I think it does. Uh, so I don't, I think we have to be careful about a kind of Jesuit exceptionalism that, you know, we're the only ones who do this kind of thing. I think that we do it uh, as just a, maybe it's a constitutive part of our identity. Uh, we have to do it. If we don't do it, we're falling short. Whereas uh, maybe other traditions, if you didn't do it, would not be a contradiction of their uh, identity. But I think, um, you know, uh, we cared very much uh, not just about, uh, I mean, I've mentioned the influence on justice and shaping society, but I think we also cared just about each person uh, as as an individual and with a story uh, and with the, with the, with a, uh, with a, a sacred story uh, that had to be um, nurtured. And, and, uh, and so I think we all uh, in our, in the university uh, 
took seriously that need to uh, respect the desires of, of each uh, student. And I also think that um, we um, foster, there was a really, it was a surprisingly really strong sense of community for a place that's the largest law school in the country. Um, we've got about uh, 2,500 students there. Uh, and uh, most of them don't live, live there, although some do. Uh, so the fact that it was able to have a strong sense of community was really striking. I think uh, we were blessed by having some, some Jesuits who would, and, and others who would help to foster that community uh, there. Uh, a lot of professors talked about Bob Dryanen as being a, a Jesuit that they were very close to. He had uh, died before I got there, but uh, that was also part of it. Father Urshi. Father Les Urshi, of course. Uh, this is a wonderful Hungarian Jesuit who's almost 100 years old. Uh, and, and still teaching. Still right? teaching. Uh, still teaching at the Law Center. Uh, he just uh, is unstoppable. Uh, so he is a, another one of those inspirations to all of us who, uh, I think one of the things that we contribute as a Jesuit school, any Jesuit school, is the sense of the larger universe, you know, that you're part of a network, you're part of a, a tradition uh, that goes back uh, centuries and that, uh, you know, opens you up to a deeper conversation, a larger conversation than a lot of other schools are, are privileged to have. Paul, that's a great segue for me to ask you to talk about your time in Rome. Uh, this network that you referred to is, of course, for us, the network of the Society of Jesus, our communities, our institutions around the globe. Uh, Paul uh, had the, uh, the great privilege of studying at the Gregorian University. Uh, and living uh, at our community attached to the Church of the Jesu, the Mother Church of the Society. And uh, you could probably walk in one minute from your bedroom to the rooms of St. Ignatius, where Ignatius uh, and his companions really founded the Society and wrote our constitutions and directed the development of the Society for the first, uh, for the first years. So, Paul, uh, tell us a little bit about how your experience of living in Rome, being educated at the Gregorian, <clears throat> and then continuing on to do your licentiate in canon law also at the Gregorian, uh, how these have also shaped your perspective and contributed to what you just referred to as uh, this sense of a broader world and certainly a broader church. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, what would I say? I, I think uh, it's a tremendous experience of the universality of the church to be uh, in Rome. Uh, you know, I lived in a house of uh, Jesuits from 27 different countries. Uh, so I don't know many other settings in or outside of the Society of Jesus where you have that opportunity. Uh, and, you know, in the States where we have something, uh, a more diverse community, it's usually, or at least sometimes the, the Americans are in the preponderance and here and there was very much a uh, small minority of the people there, uh, maybe a loud minority <laughs> as we tend to be sometimes. But, uh, you know, it was, a, it was that sense of uh, this rich uh, set of cultures, of, of traditions that still were united by the experience of the spiritual exercises. And, and I don't know how you feel a bond like that without the grace of God somehow at work. You know, I mean, you can have other kinds of bonds. I don't mean to say that, you know, that's the only kind of bond that people from many different traditions can have, but it's, it's very interesting to see how uh, people can be very fully and, and authentically uh, alive in their own tradition the national culture that they come from, uh, and yet at the same time, deeply and fully uh, anchored uh, in this, this spiritual tradition, tradition of the exercises and of course of our uh, shared Catholic faith. Um, so there was the university, universality, and then there was the depth uh, aspect, which is that uh, you mentioned being close to the rooms of Ignatius, uh, being able to go there, uh, for mass, going there just to pray quietly, uh, and 
feel that connection to the founder, to uh, to the man that you know has shaped my life uh, in so many uh, ways. Uh, it was just such a such a grace. I think you know um, in our tradition, as you know, Jerry, we put a lot of emphasis on imagination and. Uh, to have as a composition of place, being able to imagine, uh, you know, maybe sitting uh, by Ignatius at his desk, uh, you know, uh, because so much of what we do uh, in any work, whether it's as priests or religious or any line of work is going to be uh, pretty mundane. Uh, and, you know, Ignatius spent the last years of his life, uh, you might even say crucified to a desk. He was, he was at his desk. Uh, and just that uh, steady plotting work uh, that he was uh, so good at, uh, in spite of being a charismatic uh, religious founder, uh, you know, I thought that was that was very uh, very helpful. You could see the place where he would go out and look at the stars too. You know, he was fond of looking at, at the stars, and just that he sort of had those, you know, the, the mystical and the practical brought together. Um, you look at a place like the Jesu, uh, you know, it's a Baroque church, uh, but what is the Baroque about? The Baroque is ultimately about this, uh, this marriage of grace and nature, right? And so how does the grace of God animate nature and bring it alive, make it dramatic uh, and unify it? Uh, and I think that uh, in the city of Rome, you just see uh, that, played out again and again and again. Uh, it's, it's the Church of the Romans, it's the, the city of the Romans. Uh, so you see all that antiquity, but you also see uh, you know, the, the way the church has taken that uh, and enlivened it, I would say, and given a new uh, and I would say richer uh, synthesis uh, to it. Um, just having uh, friends from around uh, the world uh, is, a, is a great gift. Um, getting, you know, uh, messages from them and connecting with them, uh, it, you know, in these pandemic days, uh, I think uh, is, you know, just taught me how blessed I have, have been to have had that experience uh, with the church. Um, and, you know, uh, I think, the theology, and I, I didn't uh, go on and finish with canon law, but I uh, have some some smattering of knowledge in canon law that also I think uh, gives me uh, some uh, some tools to help uh, people uh, in my work now and uh, in other work that I uh, that I do. Uh, so uh, you know, and let's face it, it's just a beautiful place to live, and there's a lot of great food. Uh, and nice wine. So, what more can you ask for? <laughs> and Paul left all that uh, to join us here at Fairfield. Uh, the last part of your formation, Paul, was in Australia. Jesuits have a concluding year after our long years of studies that we call the tertianship, a time of uh, intent of returning again to our deep spiritual roots. Uh, Paul concluded his tertianship. Uh, which he made in Australia and joined us here at Fairfield last August. Uh, Paul, I wonder whether I might ask you about uh, what this, this uh, almost, not even a year, these past 10 months have been like for you uh, joining us here at Fairfield. Yeah. Well, <laughs> at least the last few of them have been pretty strange, uh, as I think they have been for the whole, uh, the whole world. Uh, but, um, you know, I think it's... Uh, it's, it's an experience of uh, God's fidelity, uh, I think, um, that wherever you go, uh, God is with you. And you're, you have uh, uncertainty, I do at least, when I start at a new place about whether it's going to be the right fit, or, uh, whether my gifts are going to be helpful for the people that I serve, uh, and, you know, uh, what, um, what I have to offer. Uh, and yet, you know, God has just constantly uh, both brought me down to, to earth and, and focusing on the now and on the, the present moment uh, and given me wonderful uh, 
witnesses and teachers and friends uh, who have welcomed me and uh, helped me to uh, adapt to this transition. Um, it's, uh, I think, been uh, a bit of a trial by fire uh, in the second half of the year both because of the pandemic, but also my uh, mother passed away in March. Uh, so uh, having all that uh, going on at the same time as uh, trying to uh, keep things together for uh, what we do in campus ministry and try to um, be a presence to people uh, at, uh, at a very challenging time not just with the pandemic, but now, of course, uh, since the uh, killing of George Floyd, uh, a whole new uh, chapter in our nation's life uh, that I think calls us to a profound examination uh, of ourselves, of a, the kind of national life we want to live, uh, of um, deep questions of justice and identity, uh, and uh, that's something I feel like I'm very much learning as I go. Uh, I don't feel that I've had the answers worked out at, at all. Um, and, I, and I'm also conscious that if you don't really think things through, you have the capacity to really wound somebody uh, or uh, you know, really alter the conversation in a very uh, destructive way. So um, I think uh, it's, been a, it's been a good year. It's been a rich year. I think I've learned a lot. Uh, I think I still have a lot to learn. Uh, and hopefully uh, God will still be as faithful as he has been. Well, I wonder whether I could ask you to say more about what you just uh, noted with caution. Uh, one learns to the, the need to be careful in, in the way we have conversations and discussions. Could you say what you're, more what you're thinking about there? Yeah, I mean, I think that in any conversation, any genuine conversation, there has to be uh, a full presence and, and uh, attentiveness to each of the dialogue partners uh, who are part of that conversation. Uh, and to the dignity, to the richness that each person brings to that story. And I think each of us filter what another person has to say through our own lens uh, and our own experience, which is inescapable to have to do that. But uh, you all have to do it with an awareness that you're doing that. Uh, and uh, in questions of uh, justice and particularly racial justice, uh, so much of the experience of our dialogue partners, you know, in the case of, of, of African Americans especially, uh, is of not having been heard, of not having been uh, cherished, of not having been uh, really seen, uh, being invisible in our society, uh, or when not invisible and not heard, uh, of experiencing deep alienation or oppression. Uh, so how do we uh, open ourselves to that uh, and show, uh, we just have a couple minutes left, so I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, how do we uh, show that kind of deep reverence for the other in our conversation and have frank, open discussions uh, that really air what people feel their fears, especially their fears, but also their hopes, their concerns, uh, in, a, in a, a safe, or as somebody said uh, just recently, a brave space. You know, how do you create brave spaces? Uh, and um, I think that you know our faith tradition is 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 very uh, much a deep resource for that. Uh, and, and so I think we have the opportunity to. Um, to really contribute to that conversation and to create spaces for uh, that kind of engagement. But I think uh, it has to be thought through really carefully. Uh, there are very, a lot of sensitivities on all sides that have to be uh, really uh, taken into account. Thank you very much, Paul. And thank all of you.
thank you, Father Tunney, for uh, again allowing us to uh, to meet here uh, and to uh, invite our alumni and alumni and friends to be with us for this conversation. Uh, Paul, when you were describing the early influences, Father Thomas and then Father Tom King, uh, who gave you such a sense that um, faith is open to questioning and that uh, one needs to be able to give an account of one's faith and uh, that the Eucharist is to be celebrated with joy and with reverence and an openness to the mystery of God. Uh, I can't help but, uh, but note how powerful and uh, enduring those influences were on you. Uh, that, that is, those are among the gifts that, uh, that you bring to campus ministry here and to uh, our, Jesuit, our Jesuit ministry and our Jesuit community. So uh, we are so glad that you uh, are a member of our community and a member of our university community and prep community. So thank you, Paul, and thank all of you. Uh, in, uh, in a few minutes, we'll be celebrating the Eucharist. And as always, we will be remembering all of you. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you.